My beloved, in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, good morning and welcome to our service of worship on this beautiful Lord's Day here, the fourth Sunday of Advent. So whether you are here live in person, whether you are watching us live on Zoom feed, or if you are watching us several days from now, we are glad you're here and you're part of our service. I hope you, um, I have a cough drop thingy for my throat. 
you can tell. Thank you for not laughing at me while I work it around here. And I hope that you took a moment to pay some attention to the announcements as they were going by earlier. I hope you've had a chance to fill out the friendship pads. If you are not have not yet, this would be a good time to do so. And I notice there are forms in there if you need to update your contact information, address, telephone number, whatever. If you think that you might have changed your circumstances since who knows whenever the system was updated last, please go ahead and fill that out. That would be very good of you. Notice the uh, calendar of events, all the things that are coming forward. We have a normal schedule uh, in the church this week, and I hope you will be a part of it as much of it as you can. Notice on now on Christmas Eve, that is next Saturday, between the services, between 6 and 7, we are having a cookie luck. Bring your excess Christmas cookies. And I know you all have excess Christmas cookies, don't you? You have Christmas cookies lying around. You just can't get rid of them, can you? Bring them here. And between 6 and 7, we will fellowship. So those of you who came at 5, hang around a little bit. Meet the folks who are coming at 7. Those of you who are coming at, for the 7 o'clock service, please come a little earlier. Have coffee, cookies, bring a little Christmas cheer uh, to the other people who are going to be around there. And then on Christmas Day, please note the fellowship time. Bring your favorite ornament. If you have a favorite ornament on your tree, in your home, somewhere, and just bring it and share the story of it. I think it's a wonderful idea. Bring your, bring your ornament that is special to you. Share the story of why it is important to you and maybe even to those you love. After the service today, we are going to bless the angel tree gifts. The angel tree gifts have been wrapped up and they are in the fellowship hall. So at the end of the service, I'm going to walk out like I always do. And I encourage you to walk straight into the fellowship hall and let's all gather in the back, and I would ask everyone to lay hands on a gift that is near you, and this will be the communal blessing of our congregation of these wonderful Christmas gifts. I would like you to notice also we have two scarves. We are recognizing intelligent people in our congregation off at college. We are going to be blessing those later in the service and we're very fortunate to have a rose on the baptismal font. Uh, this is for, hang on, I wrote it down. Uh, the Slater's great-granddaughter, who was born on December the 9th, young Sydney Iris, I believe, if I have that correct. Heartiest congratulations. That, that's correct. I have that right, Dick? Good. Okay. You know, it would be easier if you were here inside the sanctuary to see you and, and know that you, I've got it right. Something to think about. You too, Mike. I, I see you. I see you, Mike. Yes, I do. It would be better if you were in here also. Ish. Emily Hayes, I believe, has an announcement for us. Dang, rats. Okay. Do I have any more announcements that need to be made? No. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> that being the case, today is the fourth Sunday of Advent. We are this close. We are this close to this day that we have been longing for. Friends, let us settle our longing and rest in God as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
lighting of the advent candle of love. Love is more than a flicker within the human heart. In a hurry world with little time for others, Advent calls us to remember that in a world where we often are quick to anger and so to forgive, Evan calls us to remember that in a world where often we are quick to anger and so to forgive, Evan calls us to remember that Evan season, we affirm together that Light four candles to watch for Messiah. Let the light banish darkness. He is coming. Tell the glad tidings. Let your lights be shining. Please pray with me. Lord of all life in all seasons, help us open our hearts to hear the words of promise and love that you send to us. Like Joseph, may we trust in your abiding love and power. Prepare us to receive your gift of grace and peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
God comes to us just as we are, with all of our triumphs and worries, our gratitude and failures. We deepen our relationship with God now by drawing close and confessing our sins. Shepherd of our souls, we anticipate your coming, but do not feel ready. We have done too much, but not enough. We have focused too much on ourselves and too little on others. Restore us, O oh God. Shine your face on us that we might be saved. Please take a few moments for your own personal reflection. Beloved, Emmanuel did not come into the world to condemn, but to save. God does not come to imprison, but to set free. This is our strong assurance that in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. My friends, being at peace with God, let us be at peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Will you please take just a moment to share God's peace with those around you? Perhaps send a message, a text or emoji to someone who can't be here with us. The Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, and verses 10 to 16. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. Actually, if we could go back to that lesson, please. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Just a little bit of context here. Our Old Testament lesson is set sometime around 700 B.C. This is during what is known as the Syro-Ephraimite Alliance. Syria and Ephraim are trying to attack Judah. And the prophet says to Ahaz, God will deliver you from this. What sign do you want God to give you that God will deliver you from these two kings? And Ahaz, in a moment of piety or stupidity or something, nobody's quite sure what, says, oh, no, I will not make a demand of God. 
Well, I just told you to make a request. Why don't you go ahead and do it? All right. If you won't do it, then the Lord will give you a sign. And the sign is that the young woman, and it's a young woman who is already with child, right? That's very clear in, in the Hebrew. The young woman, oh, that one right over there, who is already with child, is going to bear a child. And here is the sign. The child will be a son. And within just a few years, when the child is old enough to know, do this, don't do that, the child will be eating honey and curds, which is pretty high-class food, okay? This is not your average run-of-the-mill baby formula mix, right? This, this is high-class stuff. Wow, you're eating honey and curds. So the idea is that within just a few years, these two kings will wear themselves out. Now, in the... Matthew text that we're going to come to in just a moment, Matthew is going to quote from Isaiah. And it's going to feel to us like he's just pulling this out of the air because clearly Isaiah is saying to King Ahaz, here is what is going to happen now. But the early church understood, yes, this is about back then, but it's also pointing forward to the time of Jesus. So this was a very normal use of Old Testament scripture in the early church. Matthew is not doing anything particularly strange in the way he uses the Old Testament. What you and I are going to notice is that in Matthew's text, it is not the young woman, right? He's going to quote Isaiah as saying, behold, the virgin is with child. You remember a couple of weeks ago, I talked about how the church evolves over time. It was that sermon about the paddles and the walking stick. Who remembers that sermon? Wow, we're all visitors today. How amazing. Okay, go back and review that sermon. It was actually rather brilliant. Yeah, you can tell. Feeling, feeling the love here, gang. I said in that sermon that at the, the start of the church, in about 30 or so AD, when Jesus is crucified, Jesus' followers are primarily rural. They speak probably Aramaic at home, but they read their scriptures in Hebrew. But by 100 AD, the church has become thoroughly urban, and people are reading and writing and speaking in Greek. They are reading their scriptures in Greek. They are reading the Greek translation of what we call the Old Testament. The Greek translation is called the Septuagint. If you want to know why, I'll tell you sometime. Just ask them. Matthew is the scholar's general consensus is Matthew is writing about 90 A.D., and he's writing in Greek, probably in Syria, okay? And he is reading his Old Testament. He's reading his Isaiah in Greek. And the Greek translation for that Hebrew word, the young woman, the Greek translation is parthenos, which is the Greek word for virgin. If you go to Athens, Greece, and you visit the Parthenon, you have gone to the temple of Athena the Virgin. That's all that is, okay? So when, when I say that, just that little bit of background there uh, to bear in mind, and that will explain what to me was always very confusing. And until I got to school and actually had a chance to study it in a little more depth. Thank you, ma'am. Reading now from Matthew chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, 
She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, what we just read, right? Spoken by the Lord through the prophet, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. Friends, this is the good news of God for us this day. Thanks be to God. And now, I believe, Miss Katie has a few words for the youngest of our disciples, so I invite the youngest of our disciples to come forward and hear what Miss Katie has to say. Good morning. Good morning. Do I sit? Do I sit on? I could sit up here if you wanted, since everyone seems to be sitting there. Me? Okay. Who wants to hold baby Jesus? Anyone? <clears throat> Anyone want to hold baby Jesus? Okay. All right. So, rules. Have you ever played checkers or chess or Chinese checkers or cards? Okay, so when you do your moves and you move the piece, there's a rule. So when you move the piece, if you, long as your hand is on the piece, you can keep moving it, right? But if you take your hand away, then you're stuck. Do you know that rule? <laughs> okay, and then there's other rules sometimes, like in tennis, you get two times to serve the ball over the net and then if you do that's it that's it that's it that's the rules you don't get any more tries do you know any other rules like that like they only give you like so many times to do something or or maybe there's a rule in your house is there a rule that you have to eat your dinner before you have dessert do you have a rule like that or do you have a rule like when you're allowed to open presents on your birthday or on christmas What's your rule for when you open your present? You know your rule? Okay, do you know your rule? In my family, we always had to eat breakfast before we opened presents. And mom would make oatmeal, which I didn't like very much. Um, or we used to have to eat dinner before going trick or treating and she'd make liver just to be mean. So these are rules. But every so often, if we love someone, We'll, we'll kind of break the rules a little bit. Like, let's say I was teaching you how to play Chinese checkers and you made a move and I, you took your hand away and I'd be like, maybe that wasn't the best move. Maybe I'll say, did you notice that other move? If you want, you can put your hand back on and move it again. Or do you play basketball, any of you? Or do you play basketball? Okay, so when you're doing free throws, how many chances do you get? Just one for the free throw? But maybe if you missed, if we loved you, we might say, try it again. And the reason I'm telling you this is that in this story that we were just reading, the rule said that Joseph had to tell Mary bye. He thought Mary had, um, the rule said that if you were, um, if, if you were um, going with someone and something happened, then the rules were you had to leave them. Bye. 
But Joseph didn't do that. He loved Mary and he loved God so much that he didn't follow the rules. He followed love and heart, his heart instead. So maybe on your birthday, maybe your mom will let you eat the cake before dinner. Or maybe, maybe you'll get to open a present before Christmas breakfast. <laughs> maybe we'll do things out of love and not always just follow the rules. Do you wanna do a little prayer with me? Okay. Oh God, help us to know when to follow the rules and when in our love with you that we should do something else. Amen. Please, my friends, you may be seated. Did your mother really make oatmeal on Christmas Day? Liver on Halloween. Boy, that, that's not even a trick. That's just nasty. Gosh. Well, good for you, Katie. You obviously have come through that torture well. Thank you for sharing that with us.
When we meet Joseph in our scripture lesson this morning, he is in a pickle. Joseph is in a bind. He is on the horns of a dilemma. Joseph is engaged to a woman named Mary. Mary is pregnant. At this time, an engagement was as legally binding as a marriage. You lived separately, but you were expected to be true to each other. Not being faithful, even though you were not married, was as serious as adultery. What is Joseph going to do? How is he going to respond? We know Mary is pregnant by the Holy Spirit, but Joseph doesn't. What's Joseph going to do? How is he going to respond? Well, Joseph is a righteous man. He is legally and morally upright. He knows the law and what it expects of him. Okay, then, Joseph, get on with it. Break the engagement. But even though Joseph knows the legally correct thing to do, he is also compassionate. He's not a hard man. He's not a cruel man. He knows what's expected of him, but he also cares about Mary. He knows everyone will laugh at him. The community will berate him. His standing in his personal and professional circles will never recover. But at the same time, he cares about Mary. And so he decides to do what he believes he must do, but to do it as quietly and with as little fuss as possible. Regardless of the harm to his own reputation, Joseph wants to do as little harm to Mary's as possible. Joseph is righteous. He is also caring, and compassionate. Well, is Joseph doing the right thing? I mean, he can't be sure. He doesn't know this child is the work of God. All he knows is his fiance is pregnant, and he is for sure and for certain not the father. Have you ever been in this kind of situation, not exactly like this, yeah, but someone you trusted wounded your pride, your dignity, left you feeling hurt and angry, made you a public laughingstock, trashed your reputation, used you so bad you wanted to leave town. Maybe you did leave town. Have you ever been in this kind of situation? Well, just as Joseph has decided to act, an angel speaks up. Joseph, it's okay. Go ahead. Make Mary your wife. The child, this child will be salvation. And you are to name him Jesus. Now, our word, okay, our word Jesus is the English equivalent or the English version of the Hebrew word Joshua. Joshua. In Hebrew, it sounds more like Yeshua, okay? My Hebrew pronunciation, I'm told, is okay, but it's not great, but it's Yeshua, okay? Joshua, Yeshua, means Yahweh, the Lord. Yahweh is salvation. Jesus, Joshua, Yeshua, means the Lord is salvation. Now pay close attention, because this is what Matthew is driving at. Jesus is 
Yahshua. Jesus is the Lord who is our salvation. This is important, okay? This is key. Write this down. Write this on your bulletin. Take this home. Remember this. Remember it today and every day. That Jesus, the word Jesus, is not just a name like Ken or Bill or Larry or something like that. It means something specific. It means the Lord is salvation. Jesus is the Lord who is our salvation. But wait, it gets better. Jesus, Yeshua, is more than our salvation. Matthew goes on drawing from Isaiah, like we said, Jesus is Emmanuel. Jesus is God with us. Again, this is Hebrew, Imanu El. Imanu with us, El, God. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is Emmanuel, the with us God. Matthew's point is in Jesus, God will save us. In Jesus, God is with us. Jesus, the God who saves, is always with us. And this is why Christmas matters. Christmas celebrates the birth of our Savior. Christmas celebrates the human birth of the God who is always with us. Jesus is Yeshua, the Lord who is our salvation. Jesus is Emmanuel, the God who is with us. Friends, when everyone and everything that we've trusted turns against us, we know God is with us. When everyone and everything that we've trusted leaves us high and dry, flapping in the breeze, we know Jesus is our Savior who is always, always with us. We are not alone. The Lord is our salvation. Our God is not distant right? Far, far away in our time of need, our God is always, always with us. And maybe that's what Joseph thought. You reckon? Maybe when he heard the angel, that's what Joseph thought. God is my salvation. God is with me. I can do this. I can do this. And so he does. Joseph takes Mary as his wife. When the child is born, he does what he is told to do. He names the baby, the Lord saves, because this baby is God with us. Personally, until this week, I had never actually thought much about Joseph as a role model. But I do now. For those times we feel betrayed, those times we struggle between righteous anger and compassion, those times we struggle between caring for someone else's reputation and caring for our own, those times we struggle about protecting someone else and protecting ourselves, those times we 
look back in anger at those who trashed us in public and made us a laughing stock. When those times come, and they surely will, we know in Jesus the Lord is our salvation. We know in Jesus God is with us in every hurt and pain and moral conundrum in which we find ourselves. In the excruciatingly hard decisions of life, we know our Savior is with us. The good news of God is God has sent us a Savior. And this Savior is always with us. When we find ourselves standing in Joseph's shoes, and when we do not, Emmanuel, our with us God, is with us. At the very first Christmas, Joseph made an important decision. He stepped out in faith. Joseph knew Yeshua, the Lord saves, is also Emmanuel, the God who is with us. Joseph knew God was with him in this very important decision. This Christmas, do you have a decision to make? Are you in a pickle, in a bind, on the horns of a dilemma? Are you torn between the right thing and the compassionate thing, between revenge and mercy, between public humiliation and doing the will of God? This Christmas and every Christmas, Remember, Jesus is Yeshua, the Lord saves. Remember, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Remember, Jesus is the God who saves us and is with us every, every day. May we remember and then step out in faith. Amen. Let us take a moment now to go to God in prayer. Our gracious God, you who recognized our sinfulness and yet loved us enough to send us a Savior, we thank you for the birth of Yeshua. We thank you for the coming of Emmanuel and all that this means for us, for the hope and the joy it gives us in facing not just today, but all our days and all our future. For surely, the Lord saves not just today, but always. And God is with us, not just today, but forever. Lord, we boldly lift up the concerns of our world. We pray for peoples who are at war, with nations warring against nations, with nations divided in wars that are civil in name only, for families that are torn apart by decisions and values and actions 
that no one can seem to see beyond. We pray, Lord, that the Prince of Peace will rule in all these hearts, these lands, these realms. We ask your blessings on those who mistake presence for the gift of God, for those who mistake material abundance for abundant life. And we pray for those who have a marked lack of abundance in their world, those who don't know the joy of having something new, something that belongs to us alone. We thank you, God, for the gift of your wisdom, the gift of your insight. And we pray for our students, asking, Lord, that they will use this time of study, remembering that books and knowledge and wisdom are good and right, and we should pursue them all but that true wisdom begins when we come to you with a mixture of love and awe. And we pray that these stars will not only be a source of warmth, but a source of reminder, a reminder of love. We ask your blessings on those we know who are facing difficulties and hardships in their lives, those whose pain and misery is known only to them, those whose pain and misery has perhaps been shouted to the world. We ask, Lord, that you will watch over Brian and Silas and Gary and Liam. We pray that Pat and Jerry and Mary will know your peace that Gib, Chastity, and Joan will know that you are with them always and that Arnold, Jolene, her sister and her sister's husband, that Paul and Jesse will know that you are not just a God in name only, but you are the God who saves. And finally, Lord God, we ask your blessing on ourselves. We ask, Lord, that when life has us on the horns of a dilemma, when we can see no way out that does not involve pain and humiliation of someone, we pray that we will turn to Yeshua, Emmanuel, Jesus our Lord, and that we will set ourselves anew to live in the manner in which he taught us to pray by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, God gave us a gift that is without price a blessing without measure in the birth of Christ our Lord. May we now gratefully, joyfully, generously share some of what God has given us with those who need what we have as badly as we all need salvation. Let us receive our tithes and our offerings.
Blessed Lord God, we, your servants, bring you worship, not out of fear or anger or debt or jealousy, but out of joy and hope and expectation of the love that we all have in Christ our Lord. We ask your blessings now on this offering, that it will go so far beyond this place that we will lose track but we know that it will be used to let others know of your great love. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. <laughs>
Remember, please, friends, uh, fellowship time, the Bible book study meeting down in the parlor. But I would ask you, please, after the final week, if you would come into the fellowship hall and join me in laying hands and blessing the many gifts from the angel tree. But remember now, as we go out into this last week of Advent, looking forward to the great festival, the Feast of the Nativity, that you and I can look to the future. We can see that the world is about to turn. We can look to the future, not with fear and dread, but with hope. Because we know that Jesus is Yeshua, the Lord saved. We know our Jesus is Emmanuel, the God who is with us. Beloved, take this good news and share it out in the world. And as you do so, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord God this day and always look at you with peace and grant you the joy of knowing them. And so let all God's people say, Alleluia. Amen. <laughs>